So praise the Lord. Glad to be here. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts. You know what we need. Lord, you know our lives and where we are. And I pray that you would continue this wonderful journey with each one of us as we look at your word and we discuss what it means and how we might live it out for you. You know the struggles that we have, each one of us, the things that we find hard to do in our lives. You know the things that even have beset our lives. Lord, I pray today might be the beginning of a new understanding of who you are and a new understanding of how you work in us. As the song says, I surrender all. Lord, may it be true today that you have all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 7, very, very contested passage. And there are people that see it from all sides. And so what I'll just try to do is do what we normally do is just go through it line by line and we'll take a look at the scripture and see what the scripture actually says for itself. Because I've been uh, a little frustrated lately looking at all of the scholars and people that talk about this passage. And I am going to give you an aberrant reading, apparently. Um, so I'm going to tell you something that the scholars don't say. So... Uh, buckle up and read your word. <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Any of you know who? Jesus. Jesus. Very good. That's a good answer. That's a very good answer. And you're absolutely right. This is, I'm titling this The Day I Died. This is the section of scripture that I gave my life to Jesus Christ with. Somebody, some brave soul named Brian shared the gospel with me, a drug-addicted freakomaniac, and God broke my heart, and I died that day. So this passage is very close to my heart, and I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony today so you know you have the whole story. I, I always share bits and pieces of it, but I'm going to tell you exactly what happened and how it happened and what God did for me in my life. And I don't like to talk about myself, so... I'd rather talk about the word. So let's get to that. If I can remember how this works. Just to remind you of where we are, we're in the book of Romans. We're in this chapter six to eight section where Paul talks about sin and sanctification as he goes through this. He's already shown us that all of us stand before God as sinners, no matter who we are. We're justified by faith alone in Christ alone. There's no other way that we can be made right with God, not by doing good, uh, not by trying to live a perfect life according to the scriptures. We looked at what Adam did when he failed and he bombed out, and we looked at Jesus and what he did and how he succeeded in the ministry that Adam wasn't able to. And we're going to talk about sin and sanctification today. Beginning in verse 13, chapter 7 of Romans. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that the law is good. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law 
that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. But I delight in the law of God according to my inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Now, how many of you have read this passage before? It sounds like a legal document, doesn't it? Like so much that Paul does. Well, we're going to get into it just to remind you where we've been. We talked about the power of the law and how when God sends his disclosed will, and we understand that in the 66 books of the scriptures, we also understand law in a much broader sense, which is more than just that. But what is right to do? And if you can remember that as a definition, the law is that which is right to do, either revealed by God or instituted by man. It is designed to come into our life to show us that we're not all that in a bag of chips. You notice that? Every stop sign tells me I haven't been perfect at stopping at all of them. Every yellow light tells me I'd better hurry up or stop. Yeah, that's right. So every law reminds me I'm a law breaker and that I fall short in so many ways. In Galatians 3, 21 to 25, it says that the law against the promises of God? Well, certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law or by us being good people and doing good things. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept by, for the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. You see, God's law was there to show us that we really need a savior. And when you really need a savior and you ask Jesus to come into your life, to give you a new mind and a new heart, then the law is unnecessary because you naturally do those things which please God because you have a heart of love for God. You have a new mind and a new heart, as the scripture says. Just so that you guys remember where we've been and what we've talked about. In Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 6 and 7, it says, Knowing this, that old man was crucified with him, the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. By the way, that's one of the reasons that Jesus died. Not just so that you would be able to share an eternity with God away from the presence of sin, but that the power of sin would be done away with and the penalty for sin would be taken upon his own body on the cross. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 6 verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Because when God does a restorative work in a person's life, they are truly different. Everything has changed. Behold, all things are new, the scripture says. And also in Romans 6, verses 16 to 18, it says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, that you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether to sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? So if you want to know who your master is, just who are you listening to? But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine in which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So we were in chapter 6 and we saw that we who believe in Jesus Christ, who have been born again, been given a new nature, are not under the dominion, the power, and the slavery of sin any longer. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's important to note because as we go to chapter 7, everything changes and we can be tempted to forget what we just read in chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 22 says, But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves to God, you have your fruit of holiness and the end, everlasting life. You have been set free from sin, Christian, if you have an, a, an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. It's finished. It's done. Sometimes we go in our old nature, though, don't we? 
And that's the problem. And chapter 7 is going to talk about that. Verse 14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual. Did you know it's not just that which governs the physical and our behavior, but it governs our motives? In fact, if you go down the Ten Commandments, the last one is that you shouldn't be lusting, desiring, coveting anything that belongs to anyone. How many of you do that flawlessly? How many of you did that flawlessly today? I woke up, I wanted a cup of coffee. I don't know about you, but most people are governed by their desires. Whatever it is that they want, whatever it is they wish, that's the next thing they're doing. Whatever, whenever the new iPhone's coming out, I'm there. You know, whenever it's one desire after another desire, and most people live their lives according to their flesh, what it is I desire and what I want. Very few people are disciplined, or very few people are resigned to give their lives to Christ and surrender all. So, the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, carne, uh, made of meat, sold under sin. Now, we just read chapter 6, and chapter 7 coincidentally comes right after chapter 6. That's the way it works. Now, he just said that we're not under sin, and here he's saying we are under sin. Either you're a slave to sin or you're not a slave to sin. What is it? You see, this is the disparity. Because if you just read through this without understanding its context, if you take the text out of the context, all you have left is a, a con. That's right. Thank you. Are we sold under sin? What Paul is discussing is every man's battle. Every human being on the face of this planet is a slave to their flesh, a slave to their desires, a slave. You were born in sin, you were brought up by sinners, and you'll continue to live in sin unless Jesus Christ saves you from the power of sin in your life, the penalty for sin, which is eternity separated from God. And we can hope for the eternal presence of being without sin before the Lord. So Paul is talking about the struggle of every person. He says, there was a time when I had the law, with, I was without the law, and I was fine. But then when the law came, sin revived, and I died. He's, he's talking about the natural consequence of hearing a rule, don't touch the cookies. <laughs> and that's all you want is the cookies. He's talking about the struggle that happens in every single human being. So don't think that you are sold under sin. If I believed that Paul was talking about himself and I was sold under sin, why do I need Jesus? I came to Jesus because I was lost in my sin. I was a slave to my sin. But I'm not anymore. So, sin enslaves you. Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. If you have given yourself over to the life of the flesh, you're a sinner. You can call yourself that. I'm a sinner, but hi, my name's Dave. I'm a sinner. Just like we're at a meeting. But I'm not a slave to it. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sins hold them fast, it says in Proverbs 5.22. The question is, is Paul talking about himself or is he talking about the human experience? He's talking about the human experience because you as a Christian, are not sold under sin. You were bought back with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, so just follow me. John chapter 8, verse 34 to 36, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but the Son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Do you believe that? Yes. I do too. We got through verse 14. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. Do you guys understand what you're doing? Human experience, you know, most people don't understand why they do things. They don't examine it. They don't think about it. They just do it because they're like seagulls or they're, they're more like birds that fly south. They're under instinct, the flesh, and that's what they do. And they don't know why they do it. They just do it. What I am doing, I do not understand, Paul's speaking of a third person of the everyman battle. For what I will to do, or what it is that I desire to do, or that I plan to do, 
that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do or what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He's talking about somebody that does not have understanding as to their own behavior. My behavior is such that I don't even get why I do what I do. The things that I hate to do, that's what I do. And I do it all the time. I practice it. I'm good at it. And the things that I don't want to do, that's what I do. And the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I, the, the weight that I believe I should be at, I'm not. And the stuff I shouldn't eat, that's what I'm having for lunch. <laughs> and it's constantly, 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 constantly my lifestyle. I am stuck. I'm a slave to my sin. I can't help myself. And I have no understanding why I got this way. Now, does it sound like a Christian experience? That's my BC experience. Right now, I know exactly what I'm doing. I am no longer a victim. I'm a volunteer. When I do stupid things, the Holy Spirit goes, uh, uh, uh. And I go, you're right, Lord, I won't do that. And then even after you do something stupid that you know that you shouldn't do and you do it anyway, he goes, you shouldn't have done that. I go, yeah, I know. Now, now I really know. Now that I got the thing that I really wanted, I don't really want the thing I got. And that's what Paul's talking about. In 1 John 5, 20, it says this, and we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding. You mean with Christ comes a new mind and I actually have an understanding of what I do and why I do what I do? Yes. That's why I love the scriptures. Because he gives us through the Holy Spirit and by his word, understanding as to why I behave the way I do. You know, there were things that I did and I never knew why I did them. You know, I got angry at things and I never knew why I got angry. My wife would say stuff like, what's wrong with your face? I'd be like, what do you mean what's wrong with my face? You're angry. No, I'm not. It took me a while to dissect what was going on inside of me. What Paul's saying is, I don't know what I'm doing. I do not understand. I, the things that I will to do that I say, doggone it, I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. and I'm going to pray for three hours. and That never happens. <laughs> the things that I will to do, I don't do. And those things that I hate, I hate. I despise. I do. Do you know this is every human being on the face of the planet without Jesus Christ? They don't even understand what they're doing. This is so helpful in evangelizing because you already know what's going on in someone's life. I don't know if you ever get the chance to have conversations with people who are not believers and don't understand what it is to be free from their sin. But to have conversations with them and let them know, you don't have to be this way. A lot of times people cover up and they pretend, you know, everything's good and fine and they put on a happy face. Until you ask them, what do you do? I asked this of somebody once. What do you do with the things about yourself that you hate? What do you do with the behaviors that are in your life that have a grip on you and you're a slave to? And it doesn't matter if it's perfectionism, it doesn't matter if it's workaholism or alcoholism or drug addiction or, or adultery or pornography or whatever it is, you hate that about yourself and you're a slave to it. What do you do with that? Why don't you ask an unbeliever that and see what comes back? Probably, oh, look at the time, I got to go. <laughs> but you see, the Son of God has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life, as the scripture says. 1 John 3, verses 4 and 6, 4, 6 and verse 9. In the ESV, so you understand the tense of this, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him, there is no sin. Speaking of Christ, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Did you guys catch that? 
If you really know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to grow out of it, grow into being Christ-like, and you're going to stop the stupid things that you continue to do. No, you're not a slave, and you don't say, I don't know what's going on. I keep doing the thing I hate. And the thing that I hate, that's what I do. And the thing that I will to do, I, that I can't do. I, I'm a slave. That is not the Christian experience. You don't continue in sin. No one abides in him, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or has known him. No one born of God takes a practice of sinning, makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him. By the way, that's the Holy Spirit of God. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Do you see? When God comes and takes residence in your life, all those things that used to be the meaning and center of your life suddenly are flavorless. That's the experience of being a Christian. If that hasn't happened to you, then you don't know him. That's what the scripture says. Our sin nature makes us a slave. A slave to your sin is like constantly taking a hammer and hitting yourself in the head and saying, ow, ow, ow. But yet you can't stop that is what Jesus came to die for so that you wouldn't be a slave to. For I know that in me, Paul says, that is in my flesh, in my natural human state, no good dwells. Can I get an amen? amen. Good. You know, that's the first step, isn't it? To realize that you're powerless. Nothing good dwells. For to will is present within me. In other words, I, I, I want to do the right thing, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. Paul, if you're talking about yourself, then there's no hope for me, and I should just give up. But you see, I've been changed, and Paul is not talking about his personal experience. He's talking about every person's experience. But when we come to Jesus Christ, all that changes. It says in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 19, as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. That's from Psalm 14. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongues have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Basically, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. There's none of us good enough. There's none of us that pursues God. There's no such thing as a seeker without God doing a work in your heart. But when we do, all of this changes. This is not the state of a Christian human being. This is the state of somebody who is unregenerate and not born again. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise, because then you have no hope. God's law reveals my sinful nature, and it stirs up to show me how badly I need a Savior. That's the purpose of the law. It's to show you what you can't do. It's an obstacle course you can never get through, because only one could, and that was Jesus. Jesus. God's law, however, does not possess the power for me to do it. God's law, just because you own a Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you can memorize scriptures doesn't mean you do the thing you've memorized. You see? You can wear a cross. I mean, Madonna does. There are lots of people that do. It doesn't mean a darn thing. It's only if you've been crucified with Christ, then it means something. So, in my flesh, there's nothing good that dwells. For the will to do what is good and right is present within me. I desire to do the right things, the good things, and yet I don't have the power. I can't be set free. That's the state of a human being. Don't you want to share the gospel with somebody that's stuck in this? I don't know about you, but I take for granted that God has given me power to say no to sin that it no longer reigns in my mortal body. It doesn't, my body doesn't tell me what to do. 
It's just like hitting yourself in the head repeatedly and saying, ow, and not stopping. That is not our experience. And that's not supposed to do that. <laughs> For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. That's called addiction. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. One of the first things we need to understand is there is something at work inside of us that is other than us understanding what's right and wrong. There is something inside of us at work that takes control. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're a slave to it. If you know Jesus Christ, you should not be a slave to it because you're not. That's why he died. So that that power of sin might be broken in your life. So, as it says in 1 John 3, verses 6 and 9, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has ever seen him or known him. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. This is the truth. Now, I have read and listened to so many commentators that talk about this passage where Paul is talking about this, and they believe this is the Christian experience. And man, that really ticked me off. Because the wealth of what the scripture says is that I am not a slave to sin, and that's why Jesus died. Now, do I still have a sinful nature? Yep. I got a dead guy strapped to me. I got to carry him around. But you know what? He doesn't control me. He didn't control you. Whatever it is that you think that you struggle with, you have victory already. We don't pray for victory. We pray from victory. Because sin no longer reigns in your mortal body. It just does not. Because we know the Lord. And I'm glad for that. Because that's what I needed. This is somebody who's desperate, enslaved, hopeless, weak, and lost. This is not the Apostle Paul. He's talking about every person. Every person that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, this is their experience. So, what are you going to do about it? This information is extremely valuable because this is an incredible tool that God can use in your mind and heart to be able to witness to other people. And I say that because somebody else spoke it to me and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Verse 21, I find that a law... That evil is present with me. That's the first step. The one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. See, I know what's right. I know what's wrong. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. In other words, there's this tug of war between my, my good self and my bad self, and my bad self always wins. That is not the Christian experience. That is every human being's experience, but it should not be somebody who's a child of God. So, don't believe what everybody tells you. Believe what the scripture tells you. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. We're told in chapter 6 of Romans, which we went over. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Amen. And so just say no. And it seems simple, but you have the ability to do that because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Well, maybe you need a self-help book. Get a self-help book, right? Get angry. You get angry and there's a besetting sin that rises up and you just want to unleash. I need a self-help book. Self-help book tells me, just disengage, count to 10. One, two, three. Self-help book, do you know how many billions of dollars that that whole group of books makes every year? And you know how many people are changed? Not in their heart. 
They've worn all their teeth out because that's the grit and they count to 10 every time they get angry because their heart's not changed. Only Jesus changes the heart. Amen? Amen. Your best life now ain't going to do it. Sorry, did I say that? Psychotherapy, that's what I need. I need psychotherapy. I need someone else to tell me what I should do because that will fix it. They're not going to be your savior. Chemicals, that's what I need. More chemicals in my system because we don't get enough in the water we drink. Love. <laughs> Maybe I, need a, maybe I need a girlfriend. I need a new drug, one that won't make me sick, one that won't make me talk too much. Well, yeah, no, not even a relationship with another human being because another human being isn't going to fix what's wrong with you. Well, maybe I need more work. Well, that's good because at least you make more money, but because of your desperately wicked heart, you'll spend it foolishly. More work is not going to help you. You just, the candle that burns at both ends burns twice as quickly and doesn't last as long. So you can go ahead and do that, but your life is done. More money, that's what I need, more money. I need more, more money so that I can do more good things. Well, not with a desperately wicked heart you won't. Money's a good tool, but so is a hammer. Maybe I need to eat better, that's what it is, my diet. I gotta lay off the pizza and the carbs and the Twinkies and the sweets and the protein and the, wait a minute, what's left? There's nothing left. <laughs> There's nothing that will change your heart other than God's spirit, period. Try as you might, look down any avenue you want. You can say om and contemplate your belly button. You will not be changed unless you surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I just wanted to share this scripture with you. Isaiah 49, 16. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. That's what God says about you. And do you think he's concerned with the fact that you're enslaved to a sin? That's why Jesus came and died. And he says that he has your name inscribed on the palm of his hands. I think that's very telling thousands of years before crucifixion ever occurred. That's how he feels about you. And he took those nails for you, so you should avail yourself of the blood. Verse 24, oh, wretched man that I am. Wretched is not a word that you use all the time. It means afflicted or miserable. What a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? You see, he's speaking from an undelivered point of view, which isn't the Christian experience. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. He's doing that to recap everything that he's discussed. And he's about to go into chapter eight. And you know how chapter eight begins? There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but the Spirit. And that's where we're going next week. Just to remind you where we were, Romans 6, verses 6 to 7, and knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, and the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. How many of you have died to yourself and are living for Jesus Christ? You're saved. You're not a slave to sin. Romans 6.14, sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under the law, but under grace. You know, you're not under the law, you're under grace. I serve God because I love him. I know you guys serve God because you love him. Not because he says, do this and this and this and this and don't do all these things. You're not under that system. You're not under an angry father whose expectations you never rise to. You, you love your heavenly father because he loved you first and he gave his only son as a sacrifice for you. Romans 6, 16 to 18, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you're that one slaves whom you obey, whether to sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine in which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. If that's true of you, say amen. amen. And aren't you glad? 
This is how this passage rolled out for me. I'm going to take you back in time to 1980. Some of you weren't around. In 1980, I had joined the military and gone in in 1979 in between my 11th and 12th grade. I went through basic training. And then they let me out to finish my last year of high school, which I finished. I went from being a long-haired, freaky, drug-addicted, drug dealer, ready to fight anybody that looked at me cross-eyed, thinking of girls only as objects to be used, thinking of people as people to be used. And I was every man. I was the guy in this passage. I ended up getting a job at a steel plant in South Plainfield, New Jersey, a place called United Steel Deck. And as I was working there, because I blew all my money on drugs and parties and all of that, I didn't have anything. And so my foreman decided, because he lived close enough to me, he would pick me up on the way to work. Unbeknownst to me, he was a Christian. His name is Brian. And Brian began to share the Bible with me here and there. And wanting to have something in common with my boss, I looked at his dashboard of his 69 Camaro, and he had a Bible, a very well-read, worn Bible. And I said, yeah, I got one of those at home. And he goes, you ever read it? And I was like, no. A Bible isn't, like, in my mind, I'm thinking a Bible isn't for reading. It's a paperweight. It's an ancient relic. It's something that you have kind of like a welcome mat <laughs> that nobody even sees is there. And he said, have you ever asked Jesus Christ into your life to be your own personal savior? I pressed my face up against the window of his 69 Camaro and I said, oh, he's a Jesus freak. <laughs> and I turned to him and I said, well, can't say I've ever done that. It's one of those things I've never done. And then he let me off the hook and we went to work. Unbeknownst to him, I was dealing drugs through work and I would come with a giant bag every day. And he would ask me, what's in the bag? I said, my lunch. He says, that's an awful big lunch. I said, well, I'm a big eater. <laughs> if we got pulled over, it wouldn't have gone well for him. In the midst of this, he invites me over his house for dinner. And I meet his wife and his kids. And I get to see the way his household runs. And he loved his wife, and his wife loved him, and was respectful towards him. And he had four kids, all of them little, and they all respected their father, they loved their mother, and they were good to each other. And we were done with dinner, he says, okay guys, go upstairs and get washed up. And they all helped each other, bathing each other and getting themselves somewhat dressed on wet bodies, you know. And these are like good little kids. They're like all little wind-up kids or something. <laughs> and I was stoned. I, was, I had done some speed, and I was smoking pot all the time, and I was stoned. And after dinner, I went and sat in a rocking chair, and I rocked my brains out. <laughs> As I spouted to him every problem I had with Christianity... Why is it good people die young? Why is it that good people suffer? Why is it that people who are absolutely rotten get away with it? And people who are rich, they get away with everything. Why is it in this world, why is there disease? Why do young children die? Why do, I had a thousand of those questions and I rapid fire machine gun them into these really nice people sitting on the couch and his wife's eyes were like this big. Her name was Sue. And when I was done ranting, I said, hey, I got to go. I'll see you later. And out the door I went. And I didn't know, but they had a conversation when I left. Brian's wife hit him. Whap! 
She goes, why did you let him into our house? He could have killed us all. <laughs> we have young children here. Why did you invite him here? I, I was. <sighs> so I'm walking home and they're on their knees praying for me. And as I'm walking home, I think a thought. I think, you know, I think I'd like to do that maybe one day. Have a wife, settle down to one woman, have children, have a house. And I remember another thought came like a bolt of lightning into my mind. Your children will be just like you. Now remember, Brian and Sue are praying. And I start a dialogue. What do you mean? I mean a dialogue. Well, what did you say? <laughs> I said, well, I'd, I don't want my kids to be like me. Well, why not? Well, I don't want my kids to be like me. Why? Because I wouldn't let my kids do the things I do. I tell you, it was probably the first time I ever felt bad about anything. It's called guilt. I never felt guilty about anything. I did what I wanted to do. My life was about squeezing life to get every drop of enjoyment out of it. And that's what my life was about. It was about me. And if you're coming on board with me and you're my friend, that's great. We're friends. And if you're against me, you're my enemy and I'll crush you. That's the way I live my life. So I started deciding I was going to rehabilitate. I was going to start stopping, you know, doing acid on the weekends and getting drunk and staying up all weekend on speed. And, you know, I was going to stop the worst of things that I was doing because I don't want my kids to have like three eyes and stuff. So I'm going to stop. And the more I tried to stop, the worse it got. The more I tried to get out, the more I got sucked back in. I didn't know what to do. After being on a party all entire weekend, I jump in the car on a Monday morning with my foreman, Brian, and he drives me to work all red-eyed, blurry, nasty, been up, you know, all weekend. And I work a day, and at the end of the day, he's driving me home, and I start sharing with him rapid fire all my objections to his sharing Christ with me. And I said, you know, I want to be a good guy and I want to do the right thing. And so I've tried to stop certain things, I didn't tell him, certain things in my life that I know I shouldn't be doing. But it just gets worse. And the people that I love, I hurt them the worst. And the people I don't even know, I try to impress. And I, what, what, I don't understand. He goes, that sounds just like the Bible. I was like, <laughs> the Bible. Jesus freak. He says, no. He pulls over on the side of Route 27. He's going to drop me off at this gas station. There's a small walk to my neighborhood. And he opens up his Bible to chapter 7. And he reads these words. We're in a gold 69 Camaro in front of a gas station on Route 27 in Edison. He reads this to me. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And I was like, okay, yeah. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. I was like, that's my life. You're right. This thing says something about me. If then I do what I will not do, I agree that the law is good. So, okay. So, yeah, there's right and wrong, and I, I, I sent to that, yes. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I was like, are you telling me somebody's controlling me from the inside? Yes. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, there's nothing good that dwells. I was like, yes, amen, I get that. For to will is present within me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. I was like, and it just got better or worse. 
For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I do not want to do, that I practice. Yes. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I'm a stinking, addicted slave to my sin, and I'm stuck, and I'm trapped, and there's nothing I can do. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that was coming upon me in that car. I find a law then that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Sure, I, I would like to have a wife and have kids and have that whole life. They'll be just like me. But I see another law in my members, in my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. My desires, my wants ruled me. Oh, wretched man that I am. He had me there. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And I was in the edge of the seat. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I was like, oh, now you're going to start with the Christian talk. <laughs> so then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. I'm like, yes, yes, that's the point. He said, Dave, Jesus Christ, God's only son, came and died, lived a perfect life, died for you and for your sin so that you would have power over the sin, that the sin would not dominate you. Amen. That's why Jesus came. Amen. And I believed. And so he says, I want you to say this prayer with me. And he bows his head and he folds his hands at the steering wheel, the engine running. And he prayed this flowery religious prayer because I didn't pray. But it had all kinds of words I didn't understand in it. And it, he said all these magical biblical things, which now I understand, but then to me it was just what? Are you reading poetry over there? I didn't close my eyes. I had my eyes wide open. I'm looking at the dashboard of a 69 Camaro on the side of Route 27 in 1980. And he got done praying and he said, you pray. And I said, God, I don't know if you're real or not. But if everything that he's saying is true, I want that. Amen. But you're going to have to show me because I'm not going to believe this guy and I'm not going to believe this book. Amen. Amen. I would never lead anyone in that prayer. But I will tell you that life changed that day. Amen. God changed my heart and I've been spending the rest of my life trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> I still went out to party, but I hated it. It turned to ash in my mouth. I still went out and did deplorable things, but I hated it. And I was trying to find joy in all the same places where it used to be enjoyable for me, but it wasn't there anymore. I heard about some friends that were at a Bible study across town. Somebody said, oh yeah, you're one of them reborn Christians? Yeah, a bunch of those guys on the other side of town, they do that. So I went to find out that these other fellow drug addicted freakazoid people came to know Jesus Christ too and we started a little Bible study. And then my life exploded. I started to actually read the Bible and started to understand it. It wasn't an ancient relic. It wasn't a paperweight. It was God's word to me. And it was my way out. My life began to explode. And the places I was going and the people I was spending time with and the things that I were doing, I didn't want to do anymore. I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. My heart had changed. My mind had changed. I didn't want the things I wanted. The good that I willed to do, I did. And the evil that I didn't want to do, I don't do anymore. Jesus Christ gives you the power 
over sin. If you're his, if you're adopted into his family, if you say, Jesus, I believe that you came, that you died for me and you gave your life for me, I want that for me. You shall be saved. The scripture says, if you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And not ultimately from the presence of sin before God, but from the power of sin in your life right now and the penalty that comes partially now as a down payment, but the penalty of being separated God from, for, from God forever. He will deliver you from all of that. If you have never done that, do it. It is the single biggest decision you will ever make in your life. Give your life to Jesus Christ because he has a plan and a purpose for your life and he wants to make it something more than you've ever dreamed so that you're not on a constant treadmill of trying to fulfill your own desires by your flesh, which will never work. So, this was me at 16 years old. This was me at 17 years old. No, I didn't get my hair cut. Jesus took a young man who was lost, drug addicted, selfish, megalomania before they ever had a word for it. And he saved me. And he made me a new creation in Christ Jesus. And he can do it for you wherever it is that you are, whatever it is you're going through. And many of you have the same testimony here in this church, and I know that, that God saved you from something. And he saved you for something. Jesus wants to do a work. And I'll tell you what, if he can do a work for me and redeem me, he can redeem you. Because I can't imagine you being any worse than me. Father, I pray that you might help us today, that your word might sink into our heart, that it might inspire us, Lord, in our minds, that we might do and say those things that please you. And Lord, if there is anyone within the sound of my voice who does not have a relationship with you, I pray you would save them. That your Holy Spirit would fall upon them in conviction that they would break down and admit that there is no good in them and that they're addicted to sin. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have delivered us from the power of sin. I pray that you help us, Lord, to live it, that we would apply the things that we've learned here from your word. Pray that you might bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 